my eyes. One, two, three, open my eyes, okay? Okay. One, two, three. Ah! Okay, okay. Yeah. 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 How did we get here? I don't know, but it looks like he's enjoying it way too much. Hi, I'm Geology Joes, and this is my friend Jacob, the Disney adult. Recently, we took a trip to Moab, Utah to explore some of the most unique and breathtaking geological formations in the United States. This will be part one of three exploring some of Utah's most beautiful national parks. Our trip began in Las Vegas, just a little over seven hours from Moab. It was a drive full of... I hope that I got bit by a rattlesnake, so if any uh, date ever asks... You so... did not get bit by a rattlesnake. <laughs> True story. <laughs> it's like uh, a... rattlesnake rattled at you and you were like, oh my god! Yeah, it was like right <laughs> next to me. Yeah. You were in that octave too. Oh my god! <laughs> I feel like I'm bullish. <laughs> Give it free. She's a dead little woman, right? You're 85 basic gas. Well, guess what? I have super gas now. It doesn't f in the. Uh, uh, <laughs> bet it's better. It actually is kind of better. Yeah. Uh, uh, the crazy, crazy cat cafe. cafe. <laughs> You're rude not to stop by. First, we arrived at Canyonlands National Park and had a picnic with a view, but we didn't waste much time before hitting the trail. Our trail of the day is called Syncline Loop, an 8-mile trail with about 600 feet in elevation gain. By the name of it, I knew it would be a cool geology spot, but I was not prepared for how geologically awesome it is. The trail is called Syncline Loop because the entire trail follows the washes along either side of Upheaval Dome. Upheaval Dome is an area that is approximately three miles across where rock layers are dramatically deformed. In the center, the rocks are pushed up into a circular structure called a dome or an anticline. Surrounding this dome is a downward fold called a syncline. In rock, an anticline is a fold that has the appearance of a lowercase n and a syncline is a fold that has the appearance of the letter U. What caused these rock folds at Upheaval Dome? Geologists do not know for sure, but there are two main theories. Much of southeastern Utah and Canyonlands has a thick layer of salt underneath, which was formed by the evaporation of ancient landlocked seas. If you've ever been to a salt flat or badwater basin in Death Valley, it's basically the same thing, but buried deep in the crust. Since this salt is buried under thousands of feet of overlying rock, there's a lot of pressure, and that pressure causes the salt to flow plastically. In addition, salt is less dense than the overlying sandstone, so over millions of years that salt has flowed up through the rock layers as a salt bubble. This bubble has created salt domes that deform the surrounding rock. The other hypothesis is that a meteorite with a diameter of one-third of a mile struck the area 60 million years ago. The impact created a large explosion sending dust and debris high into the atmosphere. Initially, the impact created an unstable crater that partially collapsed. Over time, through a process called isostasy, the rocks underground heaved upward to fill the void left by the impact. Erosion since the impact has washed away any meteorite debris, and we can now see the interior of the impact crater, which was once buried thousands of feet underground. Whatever the case may be, it is certainly a geological wonder to behold, and the rocks I examine hold the stories and secrets of the past. There was lots of colorful mudstone all along the washes. The different colors you see here are most likely due to the presence and mixing of clay minerals such as red hematite, green illite, and green chlorite. The colors are influenced by the mineral composition, 
the presence of organic material and a process called digenesis, which refers to the processes by which sediment becomes lithified into hard sedimentary rock and includes all physical, chemical, and biological processes that act on the sediment. I also saw this fun little rock, which I couldn't tell if it was a trace fossil or a weathering feature. A trace fossil is a fossil which shows the behavior of organism and includes tracks, trails, borings, burrows, and even fossilized poop. The walls of the canyon within the wash were extremely colorful and diverse in rock type, showing a chaotic geological history of shifting environments. Each rock layer that you see here represents a change in environment, and the rock type and other indicators within the rock layer can divulge secrets of the past. Typically in geology, the layers at the bottom are the oldest and the layers at the top are the youngest. When you introduce faultine and tectonic plates, it can get a little complicated, but generally speaking, that's how it goes. In this section of our canyon, it looks like we have mudstone at the bottom which can indicate a variety of environments. Red mudstone like that seen here often indicates deposition in an oxidizing environment like a river floodplain, deltas, deserts, lakes, or a shallow marine environment. In order to get that red color, you need oxygen to interact with the iron in the mud. As we work our way up through time, our younger rock layers are mostly sandstone with thin alternating layers of mudstone. This mudstone is not red, indicating that it was below water when it lithified. This type of mudstone often forms in lakes, lagoons, or the deep sea. Given the petrified ripples I discovered, I can narrow down what type of environment may have existed here millions of years ago. Ripples obviously tell me that water once flowed here, but based on the symmetry of the ripples, I can tell if this water was from a river, lake, or ocean. Symmetrical ripples indicate a back-and-forth motion caused by waves, which you would find in an ocean or large lake. Asymmetrical ripples indicate a direction of flow found in rivers and small lakes. Unfortunately, the ripples I found here are what we call float in geology, and it would be difficult to determine what layer they came from since we are in a wash and these pieces could have come from upstream from much younger rock layers. This layer we are walking amongst is called the Chinle Formation, which formed during the late Triassic period around 230 million years ago. The Chinle Formation shows a floodplain environment. The changes in rock type as we move up in time likely indicate how the late Triassic River meandered. In this formation, you can find petrified wood, fossilized freshwater fish, dinosaur bones, and rare gastropod fossils. This layer also contains uranium, so this geologist does not recommend licking the rocks here. The layers above the Chinle are the Wingate, Kayenta, and Navajo formations, respectively. The Wingate is a desert sand dune environment, the Kayenta shows a meandering river environment, and the Navajo, back again, is a desert sand dune environment. Most of the rock found in Canyonlands today came from distant mountain ranges like the ancestral Rockies and Appalachian Mountains. For millions of years, these mountains eroded and the sediment was carried away all the way across the country by wind and water, creating deposits that eventually became distinct layers of sedimentary rock. Some of these layers were deposited by rivers, their sandy channels surrounded by swamps and lakes. Wind brought some of the thickest layers, creating sandy deserts or dune fields on the shores of an ancient sea that once existed here. During this long period of deposition, there were no canyons, only vast, gently sloping plains. Many of the rocks exposed in canyonlands were deposited near sea level, but today the average elevation here is over 5,000 feet above sea level. How the heck did this happen? Well... Canyon Lands is part of a region called the Colorado Plateau, an area that stands high above the surrounding country. About 20 million years ago, movement in the Earth's crust began to build modern landforms like the Rocky Mountains, Nevada's Basin and Range, and the Colorado Plateau. 
This movement also created fissures in Earth's crust, allowing molten rock to rise from the mantle. In some places, it cooled prior to reaching the surface, creating pockets of intrusive igneous rock that is highly resistant to erosion. Eventually, erosion exposed these harder igneous deposits, creating the isolated mountain ranges visible from canyon lands. The landscape that we see today is one of erosion. As this area gradually rose, rivers that once deposited sediment on the lowlands began to remove it from the uplifted plateau. The Green and Colorado rivers began carving into the crust, exposing buried sediments and creating the canyons of canyon lands. Monsoon season also brings heavy rains that scour the landscape. Softer rock dissolves away, and layers of harder rock form exposed shelves, giving the canyon walls their stair-step appearance. Occasionally, a slab of harder rock will protect a weaker layer under it, creating balanced rocks and hoodoos. At this part of the hike, I began to understand why there were multiple signs stating this trail is strenuous and hard to navigate. It's not shown here, but we wandered aimlessly up cliff faces just to turn around after realizing we went the wrong way. But eventually, we got it. If you don't have a trail map and a good sense of direction, I would not recommend completing the trail this way. We had about three miles left of the trail when I saw something that I was not happy to see. Storm clouds. For those that know, desert storms and canyon washes don't play well together, and if you aren't careful, you can get yourself caught in a flash flood real quick. When I saw those clouds, I started booking it and keeping to the high ground when I could, which was difficult, but I didn't want to end up like this guy. <laughs> nice. Hello. It is almost seven miles into our hike, I think. Hopefully seven miles out of eight. And it's 6.30 p.m. right now. Sun sets at like seven. So, hoping to get out of here. <laughs> ASAP. A lot of this trail has been hiking in the wash, which is normally fine. But we were having some really dark clouds. And honestly, <laughs> it's made me a little bit nervous. But it looks like it's clearing up, so we should be fine. If we keep going at the same pace, I think we'll be there right as it's getting dark. Because it looks like the sun is already down over the hillside. And I can tell it's getting a little bit darker and definitely in the next like 20 minutes but I always come prepared and I have my headlamp and an extra flashlight so we're good pro tip always bring a headlamp or a flashlight other than your phone when you're out hiking because you don't know how long you're going to be out here for. We didn't expect to be out here this long, but here we are. <laughs> so yeah, always just in case, bring plenty of water and snacks, the basics, and first aid, which I need to get better at doing. It's been really nice today. It's been like low 80s, I would say, so absolutely perfect but the sun is blazing. It's really hot. But now the clouds are rolling in. There's a nice cool breeze. So it feels, it feels really nice. But the dark clouds are rolling again. They don't look as bad as before. We haven't seen a single person since the very beginning of the hike. Maybe one mile in, we saw two people. And then since then, not a single soul. So it's just been us and the trail, which is always nice. But sometimes it is comforting to see other people <laughs> once in a while. We're out here a little late, so 
I don't think that's gonna happen. I think we're the only people out here right now. We have Jacob, the Disney adult, making his way up the trail. The last quarter mile, well, half mile. Luckily, we finished the hike right around sunset and enjoyed the colors as we drove to our campsite for the night. This was my second time to Canyonlands and it only gets cooler the more I visit. It makes it even better now that I have a geological eye. If you want to follow me on the rest of this trip, like this video and subscribe. See you next time.